By definition, a relational database query language is able to retrieve data from the database. After all, that's what query means. But in addition to querying, it also needs to provide various other capabilities. It needs to be able to add, delete, and modify data in the database. It needs to be able to create database elements, including databases, tables, indexes, and other elements. It needs to control access to database elements and protect and enforce rules about the data. You can condense these capabilities into two main categories. The first is data definition language. This part of Transact SQL lets you create and modify objects in your database. The main commands are create, alter, and drop. Management Studio uses DDL behind the scenes to create and modify objects that you create and change using its graphical interface. And then additional commands support granting, revoking, or denying permissions on objects. And then the other category is Data Manipulation Language, or DML. These statements let you work with your data. Select, insert, update, delete, and truncate are all part of DML. Data selection queries fall into the domain of DML, Data Manipulation Language. And the primary T-SQL statement that you'll use is the SELECT statement. If you investigate the SELECT topic in Books Online, you'll find that this is by far one of the most complex statements in SQL Server. When you take into account all of the topics that explore the statement's various clauses, such as for, group by, having, and order by. Whenever you execute a data selection query in SQL Server, you'll be accessing one or more database objects, so it's important that you understand how things are named. In SQL Server, database object names use a convention that contain four parts, any of which can be blank except for the object name. The server name specifies a link server name or remote server name. A blank implies the current server. The database name specifies, well, the database name. A blank implies the current database context that you're connected to. And then the schema name specifies the name of the schema that contains the object. A blank implies the default schema for the current user or the DBO schema if no other default schema is assigned to the current user. And then finally the object name specifies the name of the object that you want to access. In most situations it's not necessary to use all four parts. However, the recommendation is to use the schema name with the object name. And here's a couple of examples. So in the Northwind database, you can specify select company name from dbo.customers. Now in this case, the statement would work with or without that dbo on the table name. And that's because the server uses dbo when no schema is explicitly defined and no default schema is explicitly assigned to the current user. So this form of the statement will also work, assuming that you have permissions to access the data within the customer's table. And then here's another example from the AdventureWorks database. This will fail if the schema name sales is omitted unless the user has sales set as the default schema name. In this case, the store table was created within the sales schema. So the second form of the statement will fail unless the user has sales set as the default schema name. Now it might be tempting to deal with schemas by keeping all database objects assigned to DBO and avoid creating or assigning any other schemas. But schemas can be a useful way of creating multiple namespaces within a database just as namespaces make it easier for .NET programmers to keep track of classes. The AdventureWorks databases provide a good example of using schemas as namespaces. You can also assign permissions on a schema that grant the permission to all objects within that schema, which makes schemas a powerful security tool for protecting data access. One of the most versatile statements in all of T-SQL is the SELECT statement. It's guaranteed to become your go-to tool for retrieving data stored in the SQL Server database with a dizzying array of clauses and options that let you select data from any databases and tables, shape it however you want, 
and apply conditions and filters so that you get exactly the data you need. There are many elements of the SELECT statement, but the most basic SELECT syntax just looks something like this. It has the SELECT keyword, followed by one or more columns that you want to extract from a table, with a FROM clause that identifies the table from which you want to extract the data. So in this case, this statement is going to extract the first name and last name columns from the employee's table and retrieve all of the rows. When I execute this, you can see that we have nine employees and there are all of their first and last names. Now when you're writing a select statement, it's important to understand that SQL Server will ignore most tabs, carriage returns, and extra spaces. So if you write the statement like this, this is going to return the exact same results here. So you can put it all on one line, or you can put in white space. And this is often very handy with complex select statements to make it a little bit more readable. It's easier to see all the fields that are included, and then you can break out complex clauses that you might include. So if I execute that, you see that we get the exact same results as the previous statement. Before we go any further with the code, I need to explain the difference between semicolon and go. Go is not a transact SQL statement. It signals the end of a batch so that all of the preceding statements execute together. Go is supported by Management Studio, the SQL command utility, and the older OSQL utility. In Management Studio, you can even set an option to define your own batch terminator rather than using Go if you want to. The semicolon character is a statement terminator and is a part of the ANSI SQL standard, but historically was never widely used within Transact SQL. Although it's usually not required, it's good programming practice to use it at the end of each statement. A few statements, however, require the use of a semicolon, such as the common table expression and merge statement. And with each new version of SQL Server, the number of statements that require a semicolon increases, so the best practice now is to terminate all statements with one. The main advantage of using a semicolon instead of a go is that a semicolon does not reset variables. When a go statement terminates a batch, all variables are destroyed. However, some situations require a go statement, such as when you use DDL statements to create objects in which the first statement in the batch must be the create statement. Any statements that attempt to work with the new object will fail unless you use go after the create statement. If you leave out the go statement, SQL Server will throw a context-appropriate error, which usually very clearly identifies the problem. All right, let's get back into looking at the code. You can use the asterisk symbol in place of a field list to select all columns in a table. So this statement is going to retrieve all of the columns from the employee's table. And in fact, since there's no WHERE clause, it'll select all rows and all columns. So I'll go ahead and execute that, and you can see that there are a fair number of columns and nine rows of data within the employee's table. All right, now that I've shown you this, I have to say that it's best to avoid using the asterisk in your SQL statement. You'll seldom need every column in a table. And every column you retrieve adds time to your query, adds overhead to the server, and eats up bandwidth on the network to return the extraneous data. It's simply good SQL writing practice to be explicit about which columns you need from your select statement. Sometimes, though, you actually don't know which columns may be added later, and you want to write a query that is sure to retrieve all the columns. In such cases, using the asterisk is appropriate. Just understand that you're going to pay a bit of a price for it. All right, now you're not limited to returning data directly from rows. You can perform various kinds of computations on the data. The idea here is that not every field you specify in a select statement has to be a column within the database. You can create your own columns by using expressions. And here's one example of doing exactly that. So what this does is it concatenates values from multiple columns to create a new column. This is a basic way that lets you shape the data returned by a data selection query. 
So in the Employees table, the last name and first name columns are in two separate fields. Then you can combine the fields using this concatenation operator and, in this case, putting a comma and a space between the last name and the first name. So I'll execute that query. And there you can see the results. So we have a single column name that doesn't have a name. And all of the employees have the last name, column, space, and first name. So when SQL Server receives the query, it executes the expression that defines this concatenated field, this calculated field. And the result set returns the single constructed column. Now it's not all that great that the results returned a column that doesn't have a name. Since the column is the result of an expression rather than a column that's in the database, you have to explicitly name the column if you want to be able to reference the calculated column in a client application. And you virtually always want to do that, so you're pretty much always going to want to use what's called an alias for that calculated column. And here's how you do that. So I have that same kind of an expression, last name plus the comma space plus the first name, and using the as keyword in order to name the column full name. And so now when I run this select statement, I get the same overall results, but the name of the column is full name. So aliases are used very routinely in complex SQL and are necessary for certain types of joins such as self-joins. Now, if you include any characters that aren't part of a valid SQL identifier, you have to wrap the name in square brackets like this. So in this case, I want the column to display as full space name. And because you can't have a space within a SQL identifier, I just wrap it in square brackets, and that tells SQL Server to use this as the identifier name. And so when I run this query, you can see that the column is returned as full space name. Also, the as clause is optional, so you can just leave it out. This is the same as the previous example, two previous examples. And so when I execute this, I get the same results. So you don't have to use the as keyword there. So this query functions the same way as the query that used the as keyword. But frankly, it makes the SQL statement harder to read. Particularly, keep in mind that if this was within a more complex statement, it definitely is harder to read. And as you scan the code, well, is full name a column within the, the table? Did the, the person who wrote this code forget the comma? Or is this intended to be the name of this expression? So as you can see, there can be a little bit of confusion, again, particularly if you're returning a few dozen columns from the table. So it's better to be explicit with the as clause. And the as clause is the most explicit way to alias a column and is supported by the ANSI standard. But another supported option is this notation, where you specify the name of the column that you want to return and use the equal sign. Remember that the select statement can also be used for variable assignment. But in this case, this is a column in the result set because it doesn't have an at symbol before it. So this is going to give the exact same results as the previous query, because it's just a different notation for doing the exact same thing. And there's actually one variation of this, which is right here. So this is another method of defining column aliases, again using the equal sign and a name, but defining the name as a string like this. This notation is now deprecated. And it's not going to be supported in some future version of SQL Server. But frankly, it's been deprecated for a long, long time. And it still works in SQL Server 2012. So you may still see that syntax, but it's definitely getting old. All right, so that's some basics about the select statement. Sometimes you want to retrieve only unique instances of a column. For example, say you want to retrieve a list of every job title within the employees table. So you might write a select statement like this, select title from dbo.employees. And I'll execute that. And you'll see that we do, in fact, get a list of the titles within that table. But there are duplicates. And in fact, we have a lot of sales representatives. If you wanted to generate a list only of each distinct title, that is, you want each title listed once in the result set, 
then you can use the distinct keyword. So simply by including that keyword there, it removes all of the duplicate values. And so now I have a list of just the unique titles within the employees table.